is 1103 that the meeting will be reconvened. And um, Joe, if you could um, just uh, quickly introduce anyone who will be speaking and then we'll ask the court reporter to swear everyone in. Good morning. <laughs> You're muted, Joe. I can't, can't hear anything. We good now? Yes. yes. Okay, um, Jeff Hebert's going to be speaking, the controller, uh, sorry, chief financial officer, and Dr. Dupuy, the chief medical officer, and myself, so three of us. Okay, great. Kim? Could you please raise your right hands? <clears throat> Do you swear the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Yes, I do. Thank you. <clears throat> And Joe, whenever you're ready to proceed, go ahead. Okay, I think Jeff's going to try to put up the slides. We're going to cross our fingers. We have success. <laughs> nice. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, just going through these, here's sort of our agenda, the items that we're gonna talk about. It's a long list of things. We generally follow the instructions, um, gonna spend some time in COVID in the beginning, and then talk about operating margin rate requests, comparison to ourselves, comparison over time, comparison to other hospitals, which I think gives good perspective, and uh, end with some discussion on risks, opportunities, and uh, capital. Uh, as I said, it's myself here, Jeff Hebert, on my right, Chief Financial Officer, Dr. Dupuy. Uh, Jeff's new, I'm new to the organization, coming up on two years, haven't completed that yet. Most of it's been with COVID. Jeff is less so. Uh, thankfully, he's had experience uh, in the past working for Fletcher Allen, Central Mount Medical Center, Gifford, and um, Littleton, New Hampshire. So he had some taste of uh, New Hampshire. Dynamics and Dr. Dupuy, who we're very happy. I think he's been here about five or six years. I think closer to six. Uh, background is uh, working at the e Clinic, uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock down in Keene, and also um, a UVM grad. So he covers a lot of great territory. So I appreciate their involvement. Kathy Demars, um, she's our board chair. Uh, she's not going to be able to make that. Uh, she's a nurse and she's also the executive director of the Home Health and Hospice Agency here in Lamoille. So uh, she's just got a lot going on. We appreciate uh, our board members, their involvement, but sometimes they get busy too. Um, and that's, whole, that's a whole discussion about how to get board members who are young enough to be working. So I appreciate Kathy's, but uh, she's not gonna make it. Um, I wanna talk about our mission, and um, which is to help people live healthier lives by providing exceptional care and superior service. I'm not a big fan of mission statements or vision statements. Sometimes they can be really lofty. But the two things in our mission I like is exceptional care, which speaks to the clinical measurement of quality of care, and the superior service speaks to the experience and our empathy and uh, nurturing of patients. So I really like that mission because it talks about the clinical as well as the patient experience and all of our experiences. Uh, the items below, I'm actually sitting in a room, a pretty large conference room, but these are all to the right-hand side of our wall. Community is really important, uh, always has been for our patients, family members, board members, donors, all of our honors. So we couldn't exist without the community support and help and feedback for us. Service excellence. Um, do enjoy those words because it speaks to the pride that we try to achieve in the work that we do. Nothing more meaningful than being proud of the work that you do. And I think that shows in a lot of our satisfaction surveys. And I think people do enjoy working here. Respect and compassion. Of course, very important that we respect uh, the staff, the patients, again, folks' opinion their thoughts about care delivery and working here. So I think we're, we're pretty good about that. Um, and the lifelong learning piece, uh, that's probably not just clinical learning, which is important. We have new standards. We've learned a lot this past year because of COVID. We learned a lot about vaccines, about management of the epidemiology, 
uh, but we also learn a lot about ourselves. So that life learning is uh, learning about ourselves and how we act as a team and how we manage, lead, or become a really good follower. You know, followership is just as important as leadership. And then uh, the lifelong nonprofit status. Uh, we are very thankful, humble, and really appreciate that we are granted a nonprofit services uh, to the community. So those are just some pictures of our staff having a lot of fun and um, love those pictures. And the next one, just to highlight, we're an independent nonprofit critical access hospital, one of eight in the state. Service area population, this is a subject matter we should continue to talk about because it's listed at around 30,000, but service areas, uh, the old fashioned was hospital service area. Now we talk about covered lives. Now we talk about the ACO model. When you look at Copley, you know, maybe our orthopedic service area, because we draw so many people from other areas, is probably closer to 100,000. When you look at our OBGYN service area, it's probably closer to 20,000. When you look at our ear, nose, and throat ENT service area, it's zero because we don't provide those services. So service area population and how you manage the inflow and outflow of folks that come to you much like the discussion with Mount Scutney about people coming over the border. We still have that porousness in Vermont amongst counties. So it's hard to come up with just one number. I wish we would come up with like health service line area because that would be actually more, I think, helpful in the process. We're at 25 bed CAH with 1900 admissions, 11,000 emergency department visits. How many employees? I always love that question. And I just broke it down for fun. You know, employees, you can either count FTEs, which is full-time equivalents, or paychecks, which includes everybody that got paid for a particular period or a month. How many active staff do you have? Not counting travelers, so we generally land on about 470. We have 165 members on the medical staff representing 28 specialties. A lot of those are uh, telehealth, so it's interesting. <clears throat> in healthcare, when you talk about efficiency and how to save money and make things easier, it would be great if we didn't have to credential every teleradiologist and many other teleservices because we're relying on very competent either tertiary care centers or for-profit organizations that have done that work but that's why our number is so high. We have about 50 active staff, although it's listed at sort of 165. We have six, uh, 69 million in net revenue, which is about 2.8% of the state's oversight of the 14 hospitals. This next chart just puts us in perspective with all that. This is where, from our perspective, size does matter. We are 2.8% out of the $2.5 billion budget. Um, understandably, UVM is 50%. When you look at their network, it's 61%, probably growing a bit, which is fine. We offer our humble opinion. We work as hard as we can, but we know we're not sort of setting the agenda in the state. We're one of uh, about 1,350 critical access hospitals in the country. So uh, that's important. If you look at the next slide, <clears throat> why don't you just go over the payment methodology that we have in the state. We have one tertiary care center, and we have eight critical access hospitals on the bottom. And the rest uh, used to be described as tweeners. And I don't know what that was because they're between. It's kind of a funny name for years. They would call them tweeners, but those are PPS hospitals. So for us, the CH designation is really important when it comes to payment methodologies. It does drive us to understand better ACO models and you know, total cost of care. Um, so it's important. When you look at comparisons for us, it's hard to say, well, listen, your comparison for Copley Hospital should be <clears throat> in line with what Central Mott's doing or UVM Medical Center. Probably not. So I think many uh, in the state and others are sort of looking at critical access hospitals as their own sort of comparison group. Um, Dr. Dupuy is going to go over some of the COVID-19 accomplishments. Um, I'm just going to start with that first bullet. Um, so when this hit, we didn't understand how this was going to unfold, but fairly quickly we said, why don't we use this as a incident command exercise? So why don't we look at the hospital incident command system? I'm looking at a chart in the wall that we have regularly <coughs> up. 
um, in terms of all the positions and people setting up an operations section chief, logistics section chief, a planning section chief. And so we sort of did that right off. Um, and we realized we got to get organized and then we got to help others get organized in our sort of neck of the woods. So the first thing we did was a CRT, Coronavirus Response Team, CRTCH, and that was all the internal providers, doctors, staff. And we didn't keep the group really large, but we met basically daily, set out bulletins, interpreted policy and changes. Uh, we then set up a larger one for the Morrisville area, CRTMV, which included us, uh, the FQHC, uh, Lamoille County Mental Health Services, Lamoille Home Health and Hospice, Tamarack Family Medicine, a large a PCP practice, and then the Manor, which is a nursing home and uh, assisted living. So we still meet. Um, when you talk about this whole epidemic, I think we really um, got some teamwork here, both in the hospital and also with these six members of the CRTMV, and we have shared a lot and have done a lot. And then we immediately also started up CRTLV, which is Lamoille Valley, not just technically the Lamoille County, because as you know, rivers and folks and shopping sometimes gets uh, not as clear. Uh, but that group was 39 organizations and they sort of spun off. But it was very helpful to be organized uh, as the hospital and the community. And so uh, Don's going to go over some other many other things that we did that might be of interest. Yeah, thanks, Joe. So the main challenge when the pandemic hit about a year and a half ago was how to continue our mission as a hospital caring for our community while still making our patients, staff, and community safe. And as you can all remember, at the beginning, it was quite confusing. So organization, education, and communication uh, was extremely important uh, right off. And that was a early and continued part uh, of our effort was just to keep everyone up to date with what we saw the state being up to, what we were up to, and translating the literature on COVID uh, and making it as operational as possible, sort of up and down uh, our organizational structures and our community partners. We directly helped our community partners with policy, procedures, and protocol as we had uh, a little bit more in terms of people who could devote some time to really learning about this and, and being current than say the manner uh, could. We shared the expertise, time and energy of our uh, infection prevention nurse. We directly shared PPE and shared PPE resourcing. Um, and of course, uh, COVID testing and later vaccinating uh, an early effort when it became clear that basically fear of um, healthcare was becoming uh, as big a problem or worse than the pandemic itself was to uh, get together with our CRT Morrisville uh, community partners and start a don't put your healthcare on hold policy. And it's been fun to go around to the various businesses around uh, the county still and and seeing the stickers and and sort of remembering that time as we sort of approach a little bit more normal. Um, the next thing was uh, resource management. Um, I'm going to sound a little bit like a management consultant, but uh, sort of our guiding principles around resource management that it should be prudent, science driven, and uh, and innovative. And when we started thinking about it. Uh, the first part was to behaviors, or I guess you can think of it as the software of hospital operations. Uh, universal masking and distancing are two of the most important and early on were some of the only things we could actually do. So we certainly started universal masking uh, very early. Uh, the distancing is tough when it's your job to actually uh, care for people. So a thoughtful and adaptive visitor policy basically kept people who didn't need to be here out of the hospital, reducing the number of people in the hospital and allowing for as much distancing as possible. We started testing patients, staff, uh, and the community uh, early because knowledge of who was infected and who wasn't uh, was vital. We started screening our staff, patients, and visitors. We developed a homegrown, no-touch employee temperature uh, and screening station. Uh, the later involved into just an attestation 
of uh, good health status as you enter the building. Uh, we started the uh, vaccination sticker implementation that most of us proudly wear. We, we changed the way we uh, cleaned the hospital. We uh, switched uh, the product that we used to something called Eradicate. It's an acetic acid-based uh, cleaner, whereas most hospital cleaners are either ammonia-based or uh, bleach-based. Uh, the Eradicate is actually better at killing coronaviruses and MRSA, uh, and it's much uh, easier and uh, on the people doing it and has much fewer uh, concerning health side effects. Uh, we rapidly recovered and rebooted our elective surgeries uh, after they were suspended and then restarted. We were one of the first hospitals in Vermont to have our nursing students, volunteers, and uh, even uh, Mitzi, the therapy dog, which was just walked down the hall, back in the hospital. Um, as a personal note, uh, although it was very confusing early on, closing uh, the medical schools and the nursing schools during the pandemic always seemed like an odd thing to me. It's a little bit like closing a munition plant during, during a war, because uh, we definitely needed all those people uh, to fight this thing. And uh, now that it's becoming endemic, I think the truth of that is, uh, is clearer. Then we did changes to the hospital uh, physically or to the hardware itself. We engineered new COVID isolation rooms. We transformed our five ICU-capable beds into what is now a COVID isolation unit. Um, we did this really with rather minimally, but quite effectively. We changed the conduit in the bathroom fans. All these rooms have bathrooms. We just changed the conduit size and the strength of the blower. Uh, the, it turns out the filters had plenty of capacity. And uh, just by those changes, we could change all of these rooms, could either be isolation rooms individually or uh, as a unit. That became fantastically uh, helpful. We transformed an ED room into a new COVID isolation room. So altogether, our 25-bed hospital had nine COVID uh, isolation rooms. So we felt really quite prepared. Um, somewhat uh, serendipitously, we found out that we could also uh, engineer two of our ORs to be negative pressures. It turns out, admittedly somewhat by luck, that both the fans and the uh, impellers were bi-directional. All you had to do was change the polarity and running backwards worked just as well as running forwards. Uh, we transformed many of our high-tech services into no-tech services. So basically all the doors and the stairwells and the halls that generally remain closed, usually for, uh, for fire concerns, are now held uh, magnetically open. So if there is a problem, they'll shut, but throughout the day, not hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people have to touch all the doorknobs uh, like we used to. So that felt really helpful. Uh, we marshaled our resources effectively in PPE. We acquired PPE creatively and industriously, and we certainly had a lot of help from the community very early on. Concept two somehow got 500,000 masks out of the people they work with in China, and uh, which helped us tremendously and allowed us to help uh, our other community partners as well. We initiated uh, what I think is a uh, was very helpful and seemed like a very clever burn rate approach. We have a, we have a, an example of that to show here in a second uh, that allowed us to track our our PPE to know where to put our efforts into coming up with more PPE. And of course, we actually shared the PPE and all our resourcing knowledge with our community partners. Through the strategic national supply, we acquired three Hamilton T1 ventilators. These are just marvels of modern medical technology. They're small, they're portable. They also work on neonates. So it's the first time we had a, uh, a ventilator that, that we could use on a neonate. Uh, we're thrilled to have them and they're all up and uh, working. Uh, we manage expenses. <coughs> by asking senior leadership and physicians to take a, a pay reduction, which we, which we happily did with no expectation or remuneration or payback. And uh, when I say we, I'm mostly talking about the gentleman on the other side of the table that secured PPE and PRF uh, 
funding. The telehealth uh, things that we usually have, pulmonology and um, uh, nephrology, uh, were expanded really to all practitioners during, during COVID. But that was really just an expansion of things that we kind of already did. We basically just changed what we did in the clinic to what we could do over the phone, or if someone did have a Zoom, we could do it that way. Um, we're fairly heavy surgically here, so that had some limitation to it, because in surgery, you do have to see things and touch things pretty frequently. Um, but we also added entirely uh, new telehealth technologies to us. One thing was forced therapeutics, uh, which uh, allowed us basically to replace all our in-person uh, pre-surgical joint classes and uh, prehab, which is getting people to understand what they needed to do to rehab post-operatively well. We got this uh, all online through forced therapeutics, and it can also serve as a communication device between the nurses and the doctors and the PAs uh, and the patients. Additionally, it was, it was very um, anxiety producing, I think, for the families when uh, their loved ones were in surgery to really not know what was going on when they couldn't be here in the waiting room. There's something comforting about actually just being in the waiting room, I think, during the surgery. We, we introduced uh, a new program called Ease, that allowed the operating room nurse to talk to the families via their uh, cell phones uh, and keep them updated as to what was going on, on all the time. So when they, when they just couldn't be in the hospital, they still felt like they knew what was going on. That's been a very popular uh, thing to do and we're quite happy about that. For PCR testing, um, if you weren't actually, you know, at basically where the rubber meet the road on this, about last April or March, um, you might not have recognized this, but at the start of the pandemic, the ability to do real-time COVID testing uh, was really limited throughout the state. There were really just a few hospitals who could do that. But rapidly knowing the COVID status of someone coming in who might have COVID was key to how you treat them. And if you didn't know, you had to treat them like they had COVID, which has a whole bunch of uh, unpleasant uh, knock-on effects. First of all, the patient doesn't know, which is terrible. The patient's family doesn't know, which is terrible. You have to treat the patient like they have COVID, so you're burning through your very most hard-to-get PPE like crazy, and it's very hard on the staff because they all think they're taking care of COVID patients, but they don't really know. Um, and so what it led to was just two standards of care in Vermont, one for hospitals that could do this, and one for hospitals that couldn't. And although at Copley, uh, we actually did have the, uh, the ability to do this real-time COVID testing, we thought that it was uh, really not the right thing for Vermonters to be living in a situation where there are two standards of care. So we worked with our own ethics committee, collaborated with VAS, VMS, uh, the COVID response team in Morrisville, and the Vermont's Ethics Network, and we strongly advocated uh, to ensure that uh, all the hospitals in Vermont uh, be given the capacity to, to do on-site real-time COVID testing and change the way the test kits were distributed so not only had the analyzer, you could actually run the test. And, and fortunately, this actually came to pass, and uh, that was the, the normal state of affairs uh, in Vermont. We're quite pleased about that. We developed uh, one of the first few covered all-weather Vermont winter compliant drive-through uh, COVID PCR testing sites uh, in the state. Um, although we had the Cepheid one-hour COVID analyzers, which are the uh, real-time ones, we, we thought that really to serve our community, we needed an analyzer with a much higher throughput. And, uh, and fortunately, uh, we heard about uh, the Rionix analyzer made, uh, made over in Ithaca, New York. The state of New York gave them a grant because they saw that small and mid-sized hospitals were going to have a need for this early in the pandemic. And a bunch of folks from Cornell and, and places like that got together and came up with this. And we were the first people in the state uh, to get one of these. 
So this combined with our Cepheid analyzer made Copley the first Vermont critical access hospital really to be self-sufficient uh, in terms of COVID PCR testing. So primarily using the Rionix and the Cepheid along with some use of uh, UVM, VDH, and Broad, mostly early on in the pandemic, uh, we performed <laughs> over 20,000 COVID PCR tests uh, to date. Another uh, interesting thing, at least we think it's interesting, uh, that we did early on uh, was sort of born out of us not only uh, really feeling responsible for the situation in our house and in our locale, but recognizing that part of our community was also Vermont and the, and the rest of the country. And uh, some novel approaches to dealing with this, uh, we thought were, were worth the effort if, if, if we could uh, be engaged in such a thing. And as it turned out, one of the many companies uh, trying to develop a useful antibody testing for COVID, Ray Biotech out of Georgia, uh, obtained an FDA uh, emergency use observation for their test kit. And we acquired some of these and uh, we were the first people that we certainly heard of uh, to actually uh, test this in a real life clinical uh, conditions. Uh, and unfortunately we found out that uh, it wasn't quite ready for prime time, but uh, I think it's pretty indicative of the approach we, uh, we took to the whole thing. And finally in vaccinations, um, we took the lead role in creating and managing vaccine clinics uh, responsible for most of the COVID vaccinations in this area. Altogether, we gave uh, over 14,000 vaccines during phase one, actually here at the hospital for healthcare workers and first responders. We gave almost 3,000 doses. And then we moved over to the local VFW where <laughs> we gave over 11,000 doses. Uh, this was particularly satisfying for two reasons. One is that the whole medical community in Lamoille coalesced around this process and they volunteered their time. We always had a physician NP or PA at these clinics and they were from all the, all the different groups uh, in Lamoille. And, and we had a, a real chance to, to meet and work with uh, the veterans at the VFW. They really continued uh, their lifelong dedication to, to service by really adopting and, and making this uh, clinic possible and successful. And uh, Lamoille, uh, last time I looked, uh, was the number one county uh, in the state with a vaccination rate of 86 and a half, which even beat Chittenden at uh, 85 and eight tenths. Great, thanks Don. Um, lots to talk about, but it's what has consumed us for the past 18 months. And uh, still there's a lot of residual coattail about this that we still talk about, of course. A couple things, uh, interestingly, we did this first off, uh, you know, what is the critical PPE? What is our performance in black? What is required attention in yellow? And then if we go below the critically low red line, and these are set for different time periods, but this sort of helped us quite a bit. We've evolved that to only needing four indicators. So this is what we currently do. Um, this is our latest printout of this. We look at this all the time. It's just a great monitoring technique over time to make sure that we're not getting too excited about natural variation or when do we start to get excited about we need to uh, improve things. Uh, going into finances, um, I wanted to mention these things before I turn it over to Jeff. Um, Really, if you say what's most important to us, it's really uh, this particular chart, which looks at our operating margin as opposed to our total margin. You know, we've had a pretty challenging number of years. Uh, we got projected 21, but we've got five years of losses there. And those have been pretty staggering. I got here towards the end of FY19. I thought FY20, we're actually gonna work double time, which we did, and really apply ourselves to do everything possible to manage expenses and look at improving systems. But um, because of COVID and because of all those um, disruptions, um, we sort of ended another year uh, negative. Um, so I just wanted to share that because it does become a real driver. And Jeff wants to talk about some of the numbers that got us there. So I'm gonna turn it over to him to go over the income statement balance sheet and cash flow. So again, up on the screen right now is the three statements, the income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow. A lot of numbers. I'm going to jump into the next slide, which is our volumes. 
And when we take a look at this, uh, um, you know, go over um, some of the uh, major volume um, assumptions that we had going into this year. The first thing I'd like to communicate is, you know, when we look at our budget process, we give our managers, you know, the experts in regards to where we've been with volume, where we currently are with volume and where we're going to be um, over four years of data. Um, we really felt that it was needed to uh, give them as much data as possible because of unfortunately the last 18 months of COVID has really uh, um, been kind of an interesting issue with budgeting. So when we take a look at these numbers, um, up on the screen we have how we compare to annualized 21, our budget 22, and how we compare to budget 2021. Um, overall, when we came to you last year with our uh, 2021 um, budget, you know, our managers uh, went into that process not knowing what the new year was going to look like, so they were very conservative with their volume assumptions. Since then, we've had an opportunity, and we'll uh, dig into this a little bit deeper um, into the presentation, but we uh, um, added a neurologist to our staff as well as a podiatrist to our staff, which have um, increased our volumes um, as well. And if you take a look uh, where you look at the budget 2021 to the budget uh, um, 22, you see that there is a shifting um, between um, the inpatient and outpatient. And what is causing that is something that happened with Medicare. Medicare has a, a, a list of what they call inpatient only procedures, um, meaning that uh, if we were to do them in the outpatient setting, Medicare wouldn't actually reimburse them. They, in 2021, actually changed um, and started to um, move um, a lot of the inpatient procedures um, and considered them to be able to be done in, in an outpatient setting. Um, this is something that Copley embraced uh, quite quickly. Um, and one of those procedures was actually um, the inpatient ortho cases. And so because of that, you're seeing that uh, budget to budget, we have a decrease of 8.6 and an increase of the outpatient, and that's what's causing that. Um, overall, um, you know, I know a lot of the questions is uh, always, um, you know, the projections that uh, you came in with um, in regards to 2021, are those still um, valid and on track? And I, I'm happy to um, communicate that they are. Um, and uh, um, the other thing that I have been hearing, I've been watching some of the, uh, um, the presentations, is what about uh, the numbers if, uh, um, you know, you went back to pre-COVID volumes? And we did run that uh, that study. I ran that study, and uh, um, overall, when uh, um, I got to the uh, 2022 budget, I saw that uh, those numbers um, only produced an, a 0.8 of a percent of a variance. So that was uh, made me even feel more confident with what we're submitting to you guys today. Um, the other volume assumption is in the uh, Mooresville area. We do continue to see that uh, um, our populations are getting older and uh, we do um, still are seeing that, uh, you know, we are moving um, away from a, a commercial type payer mix more into a Medicare payer mix. Next slide is our reimbursement methodologies. First and foremost is our Medicare. And again, um, when we take a look at the rate increase, it's important to know that we are a critical access hospital. We are a cost-based hospital. And for Medicare, um, if our um, rate increase is commensurate with our cost increase, then for Medicare, we will actually capitalize on that rate increase in its enti um, entirety. The Medicaid in regards to our 2020-22 budget, um, we did not uh, um, actually uh, um, assume that we were going to get anything through the rate increase from them. And then moving into um, the commercial payers, um, we did realize in the 2022 budget the complete uh, um, increase in uh, rates. So overall, our rate increase, um, we requested a 5% rate increase. That equates to 3.8 million. And 1% of that um, is uh, um, equates for us to be 734,000. Um, you know, even knowing that we are going with the uh, 5%, uh, we still um, are um, forecasting a very modest margin of 1.2. You know, um, feel that a critical access hospital should be, um, you know, closer to a 2 to a 2.5% margin. But, um, you know, when we take a look, Joe showed you that slide uh, prior, um, which had our history. 
we are in a rebuild year. We need to uh, um, address the poor years of uh, um, performance. Um, and uh, we need to be able to invest um, in the capital for this organization. We need to invest in the staff of this organization. And we need to uh, just cover um, all the inflationary uh, concerns that uh, um, we're currently um, undergoing. Great, thanks. Um, just wanted to go over this chart. This is a uh, rate request uh, past performance and comparison. So Copley's in blue. You've got columns there of uh, average submitted and then what was approved, um, five-year, 10-year, 15-year comparison, those three columns. <clears throat> Green means it was the lowest increase out of everybody in the state. Red means it was the highest increase. So that first uh, five years uh, of late, <clears throat> we've actually had um, two and a half percent less than we requested. So we requested 5.14, and uh, the average that we got uh, is 2.64. If you look at the past 10 years, our request dropped by only 1.4%. We requested 377, granted 242. In the past 15 years, much closer, we were only sort of clipped, for lack of a better word, by 0.9%. Um, so it's interesting. I think Copley in the past five years has really suffered a lot of uh, changes in terms of um, trying to figure out what to ask for, how does that work, and what does that look like over time? And how does that compare to others, which seems fair and reasonable? Um, we're looking at a 5% System average on the bottom right there is 4.91. System weighted average is 6%. I think 5% is probably reasonable uh, in retrospect. Um, and I'll go back to some previous conversation with Mom Scutney. <clears throat> I'm hopeful that you might even tell us that uh, we should be requesting more than 5% because when you listen to the rest of the story, maybe we're still not getting it right. If you go to this next one, this is the past comparison and outcome. So again, we've been the lowest for a number of years. We're the second lowest in the past five years. I think Rutland was the lowest in the past five years. Um, but if you look at the all-payer cost of care chart to the right for this time frame and then some, we have always been the lowest um, in the state, uh, only tying with Burlington in 2013. But we have been by far the lowest. And we are waiting for the updated data. Um, this is uh, claims data, and it's always very frustrating because it takes so long, but I I'm just hopeful that we'll get 2019, if not 20 data, so that people can sort of look at this. And uh, the total cost of care um, definitions are, we, we have those, we have questions about that. Uh, when you look at our rate requests, how well we're doing on outcome and overall cost, I want to bring up another subject, which is uh, just actual prices and what we charge. <clears throat> I think prices I think prices still matter. People have health savings accounts. People really do look at prices. I think we've had a lot of disclosure of prices on the internet, and so this will continue. So we were asked to do this for some local folks here uh, in our service area to do a price comparison for laboratory services. So they gave us these 10 particular CPT codes that were most commonly used by these primary care folks. There's the Copley price. There's the Quest price. Quest is a for-profit out-of-state lab organization that is housed in New Jersey. So uh, I'll just say this. Unfortunately, you know, all the profits and capital and investment goes there. And then to the right, there is the Vermont average with all the hospitals in state. And then the four to the right of that are ones more proximate to us than we thought, you know, people had a choice to drive to. So when you look at these uh, charts and prices, uh, we are the lowest on all tests by far. And if you look at a few of them, like lipid panel, which is the second one down, our price is $60. Quest is charging $148. The average is $107. And uh, we are significantly lower. And sedimentation rate down below, third from the bottom, we're $11. And the highest, uh, at least in the study that we saw for the few, is up $50. So our prices on lab testing is quite low. If you go to this next chart, this is just price comparison to inpatient rooms. This stuff used to be easier collected through Act 53. And since we've been through some of these changes, it does take more effort. But 
price does matter. So inpatient room and bed count, um, we're at 1,300 emergency room levels of care. The next section is the five levels of care. Again, we are, we're, we're less than the Vermont average and sometimes significantly less. And then there's some on diagnostic imaging. And um, I think on three of those that have been starred, we're the lowest in the state, but we're actually second lowest on a lot of those too. So we think our prices are extremely reasonable and fair, and we probably need to work on those as it relates to our operating margin and trying to get healthy. Um, if you look at fourth from the bottom for diagnostic imaging, it's kind of interesting, CT of the abdomen and pelvic with contrast, we're charging 1423. The average is 3,600. The highest is 6,000 on the very far right, 5,921. That's $4,500 more. Some people do ask about this stuff and some people are shopping and I think that's healthy. It's part of the pressure on all of us to say, keep your costs down. And there's a variety of ways of measuring cost. One of them is actually how much did it cost me? What is the price? Uh, and in the very bottom one, MRI joint of lower extremity uh, without dye, we're at 1665. Um, we are the second lowest, the lowest one to the very far right, uh, second to the right is 1525. So you could save $140 if you went to that hospital. Um, but there's one sort of towards the middle at 4,321. So again, we're $2,600 less. That's actually a really big deal. So we've had some price issues uh, that Jeff and I and others continue to look at. If you go back to operating margin, uh, I'm not really proud of this chart. Uh, we end up becoming possibly uh, the biggest loser. If you remember that old TV sitcom show, I guess it was reality TV, I'm not sure, but uh, we've lost money for those uh, five years in a row. We haven't finished FY21, so that's not on here. We expect to have a positive operating margin with some of the relief coming from COVID funds. Um, and uh, there's a note in the box in the middle about, you know, the sustainability efforts and, you know, the board ordering um, six of the 14 hospitals to look at sustainability planning and address concerns about consistent operating losses. This all came out of the Springfield eventual bankruptcy. I think everybody sort of knows that and politically that became a very sensitive and difficult issue. Um, so we were one of the six. Um, I think we've done you know, we're working really hard. So if you look at the chart on the right, five-year average, Springfield certainly takes the cake with the amount of losses, but sadly, Copley is right behind. So <laughs> we're in a turnaround. It's a financial turnaround. It's gonna take a lot of time and effort. We have a lot of passion behind it and teamwork, but I do wonder if you're an outside person just looking at the tea leaves, you would think Copley probably needs some more help and assistance. Otherwise, I don't want us to be labeled as the next Springfield. If you go to the next chart, this is looking at our losses and also looking at the approved rate increase in blue and what we requested. So for 2016, we requested negative three, we got negative four. The next two years, we just asked for a zero rate request increase, but we got you know, hit pretty hard with negative 3.7, 3.4%. Um, and so we did get decreases up until uh, 2020. So I think there is a correlation between those in terms of your ability to generate an operating margin and just your basic rates, um, regardless of whether you're a CAH or a PPS because there's um, other mechanisms that come into play. Um, if you look at our 2020, um, Margin request, um, we're at 1.2%. Grace Cottage is less. We probably, many of us know Grace Cottage um, enjoys some significant support through donors in the community, which we are very happy for them. Uh, ours looks modest. Uh, we do all hope Springfield can pull off 3.4% because everybody's been caring for them on the side. Um, and this is all based upon a uh, rate increase of only 5%. If you look at the next chart, this is uh, long-term debt to capitalization. You know, what are the most important things that I can think about we should all look at as a hospital? I mean, there are so many indicators, but what are the most important? I think your operating margin is really important. I think cash is important. Jeff's gonna talk about that. 
you know, your rate, uh, your long-term debt capitalization. So in this particular chart uh, on the far right, summary of the table, we're down there with Springfield at 16%. You might think that's a good thing. Um, I actually spent uh, a year and a half down in Martha's Vineyard as the CEO down there. They had so many donors that their debt to capitalization was 0.6. It didn't even cross the 1%, but, but they raised $50 million in the blink of an eye to build a new hospital. So it's nice to have that lower. The problem with some of us, Springfield might be in that case. Copley is definitely in that case. We have underfunded a lot of capital around here. And although the average age of plant doesn't look that bad, I would love for us to talk more about that because Jeff discovered a significant write-off um, that occurred a year or so ago that really drove our average age of plant probably inappropriate in the wrong direction. But we've had We've been working on broken sidewalks. We've got sewer drains in parking lots that have collapsed, you know, fearful that a truck or a person would fall down in them. We've got IT infrastructure issues. Pretty much 100% of our laptops and PCs have needed to be replaced because they're running such old software. And uh, we've been in fear of that, and we're putting as much money as we can because of the experience at UVM with that cyber terrorism. Um, We've got parking lots that are so rippled, some people's cars scrape the bottom of them when they park. So we're trying to work on a lot of those. And um, we have rooms here that are so antiquated. Um, there's a few that have bifolding doors that uh, you can't actually use the toilet and close the door. It's not even possible. You have to actually leave the door open when you stand or sit using the toilet. Uh, hard to believe, not proud of that fact, but I'll tell you, it's, uh, it's pretty shocking. So with that, I'm gonna give this to Jeff to talk about day's cash on hand. Okay, so the next two slides, um, you know, Joe was talking about our capital, our need to, uh, um, to invest in this organization, both in the uh, facility itself, as well as the equipment. Um, you know, uh, we just had our, uh, um, our interim audit and, you know, we were talking to uh, our auditors and, uh, you know, saying that we were, you know, looking at uh, um, working with different organizations to see what the possibility of securing debt was. And, you know, I love that uh, the auditors kind of came back and said, if there was a time for new financing, now is that time um, for us as Copley. So the next indicator that we're currently on is days cash on hand. Um, <clears throat> Again, um, you know, these two indicators, uh, um, days cash on hand and debt service coverage ratio, are very popular um, indicators related to uh, debt covenants. And uh, in regards to days cash on hand, you know, the higher you are, the better you are. Um, the higher you are, um, the more, um, you know, uh, an organization is willing to take that uh, risk on, uh, um, on giving you financing for your upcoming projects. Um, overall, um, what we did with this graph is, um, I, you know, we've been talking a lot about, you know, COVID, um, and a lot of our numbers right now are getting a little bit skewed. One of the uh, um, areas that is getting um, skewed is the Medicare advance payments. This was, uh, um, you know, substantial money that uh, when COVID started, Medicare um, basically gave all hospitals. Um, right now, that money does live on our balance sheet. And that money is going to be, uh, um, you know, um, as Medicare makes their payments, we're actually utilizing that money, um, you know, to, uh, um, to uh, um, they don't pay us. Um, and they're using the, uh, they're telling us to take it from the Medicare advance payments. So for this graph, I actually removed that. Um, I do want to communicate that the, uh, the COVID monies in 2020, 20 um, are still in there. That's our PPP and our PRF monies. But uh, when you take a look at that, we're at 84. Um, again, the second lowest only to Springfield. When uh, we asked uh, um, BKD, you know, um, what uh, um, you know what that number means, they actually basically communicated and said, "Look, you know, if you uh, are running, um, you know, between 60 and 70 days, um, that represents a hospital in distress." So um, we're not that far off. Um, we need to get that indicator better. 
The next uh, um, day's cash on um, hand chart is just a uh, chart we're putting back in the advance payments. Um, it does get us up to the 98, but uh, by the end of uh, next year, um, that money will be consumed and uh, won't be actually on our balance sheet. The next indicator um, is the debt service coverage ratio. This uh, ratio um, specifically measures an organization's ability to produce enough cash to cover its debt. Again, this indicator, um, you know, basically uh, looks at um, the higher number is the better number. And uh, so over the last five years, um, you know, Copley has uh, um, had, you know, um, cash issues due to its uh, poor performance. Um, so we did, we went out and uh, we worked with Echo Financials to say, you know, what is our ability to secure additional debt? And uh, um, unfortunately, when they came back with the study, um, they pointed to this indicator and they said, look, uh, you know, right now, looking at your past uh, year's performance, um, it was this indicator that would just be, um, you know, uh, too risky for anybody to, uh, um, to uh, you know, grant us or to give us that money to actually start investing in the, uh, um, in the, uh, uh, into our capital needs. The next chart, again, is now like, just looking at the last four years. And when you take a look at that, that gets us down to even lower, about 1.7. Um, you know, Grace and Springfield are the only two lower ones um, in regards to, uh, to this indicator. So, right now, um, overall, the next slide that we're looking at is our um, provider transfers. I did communicate earlier that we did have a, um, two. Um, we did, you know, in 2021, um, um, work with the Green Mountain Care Board on getting the appropriate paperwork uh, um, supplied. Um, we were able to uh, um, actually hold on to a neuro neurologist who worked across the street at the local FQHC, was going to leave the area, but uh, um, has since uh, changed um, direction, and uh, we were able to hire her. Um, so overall, uh, we will be picking up uh, in the 2022 budget uh, additional clinic and lab revenue from that provider. Another provider um, actually uh, um, came from Central Vermont, wanted to work with us as well. Um, and this provider will represent uh, additional overall revenue in clinic as well as all other hospital services. All right, jumping on to operating expenses. <clears throat> You know, due to uh, our uh, um, prior year uh, um, performances, one of the easiest um, areas that uh, everybody seems to go after is they look at cutting uh, salaries and wages. Um, and that was um, the uh, case for uh, Copley over these last five years. Um, this has uh, unfortunately um, resulted in, in a high burnout rate for us. Um, and it only was uh, um, exacerbated due to the COVID situation. And so what has been happening is we're actually finding that, uh, you know, as you've been hearing from other organizations, that we needed to, uh, um, as these employees um, moved on from Copley, um, we have been using um, a great deal of travelers as well as contracted services to offer the care here at Copley. Um, overall, you know, we feel that uh, we really need to pay special attention. I guess you could call it an opportunity to rebuild our, uh, um, our uh, FTE to be able to put a redundancy into um, our department so that if we lose a key personnel, that we have another FTE to take that um, place of that personnel instead of relying on uh, contracted services. Yeah, just as a specific example, uh, when I got here six years ago, I was the only uh, surgeon at Copley. Every, every two weeks, we brought a locums in if we could find one to take some call for a while, but uh, mine was the only clinic. And I had a clinic every day and uh, I had a nurse and an MA. Over the uh, years of cost cutting, uh, that has led us to the situation now that we have two surgeons in general surgery here at Copley. Uh, I'm busier now than I was then. Uh, Dr. Olmsted is uh, at least as busy as I am. And we have one nurse that we share between us. The department we worked in, the, the multi-specialty clinic, also used to have a office manager uh, that was lost in the cost cutting uh, as well. So we we've seen our, 
our availability decrease, not really so much in that we couldn't see the people, but we just don't have enough uh, hands to help us to operate the clinics uh, efficiently and at appropriate uh, volumes. So this, this is not really a theoretical thing at all. We, we see it in practice uh, every day here. And it, it's just the, the, the people analog to the problems we're having with the, with the physical plant. Overall, our next um, slide, um, you know, goes over other key areas. Our benefits, um, you know, came in line with where we expected them working with our brokers at 4%. We did see uh, utilities go up, uh, um, you know, overall 13.2%. Um, our big driver on this one is when we went and uh, um, asked for pricing on our oil and gas um, that had an overall increase of 25.5%. <laughs> One of the uh, indicators that typically, um, you know, we talk about during these presentations is pharmaceuticals and uh, how that raises year in and year out. And for this year, it was actually in line. So that was a uh, um, story. <laughs> Our provider tax, um, again, it's generated by uh, net patient revenue. Um, it looks at the uh, annualized uh, six month uh, 2021. So that one um, we have no control over. And then all of our other expenses overall did come in line, um, either plus or minus 3%. Non-operating for us, um, this is a uh, um, basically uh, what we submitted last year, um, and that is uh, our annual fund going up 240,000, and uh, our income on gains and investments uh, going up 57,000. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, back to me, just talking before I get into risks and opportunities is the slide that keeps me up at night, <clears throat> keeps us up at night, and that is, you know, where are we going to really aggressively turn things around? Uh, without the projected 21, uh, the curve is pretty steep with that regression line. We're hopeful to make a difference and um, settle things out. So that's just been our, um, our mandate. Um, in terms of risks and opportunities, <clears throat> I think financial stability is right there. COVID is right there because of what it has done to us over the past 18 months. Certainly uh, the Delta variant or any additional waves, we sort of see waves that occur, uh, the lingering operational expenses. Um, you know, it does change some of the future volumes. It changes staffing. I mean, we've really work double time to ask people to be extraordinarily flexible with their schedules and to address things with our patients as much as possible, irregardless of the cost and who pays for it. And I think we've done well with that. <clears throat> we've also been looking at and have that curious thought about what about the demand destruction that is occurring because we've changed, we've significantly changed and some stuff's not gonna come back. In telehealth, we've had telehealth in place. That has changed dramatically and um, we don't know five years from now, and five years is not very far period of time, you know, there might be a lot more interesting telehealth services offered by uh, tertiary care centers, UVM, maybe Dartmouth uh, nationally. I think this whole pandemic has changed a lot of how we deliver things. And uh, the legacy services, I think, might be changing uh, quite a bit. Staffing is a huge risk. <clears throat> We're very small, so if we lose one or more key providers, even one, it makes a difference. If we pick up a couple providers, I know Jeff talked about, um, you know, we, we gained a couple of uh, providers. Um, we took those because those folks would have actually left the area. They would have actually left Vermont. And we said, well, I think that's probably something that we should look at addressing, but um, we're very fragile in that regard. So it's true for not just the providers, nurses, support staff, technologists, billers, and even leadership. So leadership changes, uh, and I constitute uh, one of those, of course, uh, but we've had a lot of changes in the past year or so, probably around 70% of our senior management team has changed for a variety of reasons. <clears throat> And we're very open and uh, willing and try to encourage people to find their niche and to find their place and to make sure that this job feels rewarding and agreeable. We've had a couple people, and I think the pandemic's been a big part of it all across this country. They have decided to change careers. They have decided to 
uh, you know, elevate their relationship with their kids that might live in Ohio or somewhere else, and they're just going to say, it's time to move. I just want to be with my kids or my grandparents or my parents. And so we've seen that. We've had a senior manager actually change their job and become uh, one of the chaplains. We had a vacancy in a uh, chaplain position, and we had a senior manager say, that's something I'd like to do. So we're just seeing a lot of that. So that's a lot of change. We had about 16 managers and mid-level mid managers, sort of middle management also changed. So leadership's been a big deal. Um, when it comes to staffing, um, we need to both rely on good people and not just good systems. Uh, we also do need travelers currently. We need lab techs. I mean, the lab tech traveling business went from zero to 100. Uh, you could get a lab tech as a traveler easy. There are you know, a dime a dozen up until when COVID hit. When COVID hit, everybody was consuming lab personnel and resources. So it was interesting, whether it's the Department of Health, other hospitals, everybody testing, uh, for-profit you know, pharmaceutical companies, it just sort of went crazy. I, I couldn't believe it. We, we all couldn't believe how much it costs to get lab travelers. Although we've been filling the pipeline with all of these, with both nursing students, LNAs, radiology techs, lab techs. So we're working on that. For us, uh, we are gonna be looking at some more housing options because uh, we've lost travelers who come here. They're really happy. And uh, within a short period of time, they said, I can't even find housing and they leave because of the pressure from sort of the stow area. This is, you know, everywhere. So I'm not saying it's, it's, it's hard here, but it's hard everywhere. Uh, we're looking at benefits uh, like daycare. We'd love to have some on-site daycare to help folks, you know, younger staff. So the six organizations that I mentioned earlier, CRT, MV, um, we're all looking at participating and, uh, you know, a daycare program where six of us support. And we've got benefit issues uh, that we're working on and spending money on. And the sustainability issue, I think we've talked about that. We are we must improve operations, standardize more things, increase the accuracy in our data collection indicators and the management feedback. And the uh, Don, did you wanna make a comment? Yeah, it, it's really hard uh, to overestimate uh, how difficult it is when good people leave small organizations yeah. like Copley. That the curse of the competent uh, operates in places like Copley to a tremendous degree. The, the, <clears throat> the more competent you are, the more hats you have. And when those people leave, it, it leaves a huge hole in the organization that's very hard, very, very hard to fix. So um, working people to the nub, uh, before COVID, and uh, basically everyone got work to the nub uh, during COVID is is just you know it's a tremendous risk and the threat to our ability to be sustainable. Thanks, Don. I've curse of the competent. I haven't heard that before, but that's that's a really good point. So uh, lastly, in terms of uh, opportunities. Um, probably the biggest opportunity Copley has <clears throat> is in building relationships and trying to help develop social capital. All of us, members of the medical staff, leadership people, supervisors, managers, just folks working in teams, um, that relationship building, I think, has taken a hit over a number of years. So we are trying to invest in those opportunities. Um, we do like the efficiency of you know, Teams and Zoom, and it's been very helpful for where we were through a pandemic, but we're very happy to be meeting again and to getting to know people, because when you have that, you can operate and have much greater commitment in a variety of ways. So, with that, hopefully we will also get uh, donors, board members, volunteers, and even staff. So we're working on all that. Um, and hopefully our total margin starts to get better. I always say to folks here, we can only control our operating margin. That's what we do each and every day. Total margin is driven off of donations or the stock market or some other benevolence, but uh, we're hopeful to work on that at some point too. Um, to build on our outstanding reputation for clinical patient care services experiences. Uh, we are looking to build a little bit of the OBGYN program. We have one provider, much like Don was describing himself, who works tirelessly and we have to bring in a lot of support for him 
to keep our birthing center and everything to work smoothly. So we're looking at maybe an OBGYN. We're doing some joint recruiting with other organizations, which is helpful, and we do a lot of shared staffing. Master facility plan is a big issue. Uh, if we're going to spend any dollars on facility or equipment related things, we really need to make sure that we've got a long term plan. So there hasn't been a um, a very good one up until this point since the surgical build a few years ago, which came out excellent. That was actually a very well sound project, but we're working on the next uh, one to five to 10 years. And then I think a lot of opportunities are with that group that I mentioned, the six members of the uh, CRTMV. Um, and so there's a lot to be said there. I wanna pass this over to Jeff. He's gonna finish up quite quickly with um, budget numbers and some of the value-based programs. Yeah, thanks. So overall for our value-based um, care participation, um, right now uh, um, we did uh, um, work with the Green Man, I mean with uh, One Care. Um, we as an organization will be joining the commercial product that One Care offers. Obviously we will continue to uh, um, be invested in the Medicaid um, product, um, but at this time we um, are not looking um, at uh, dipping our toe into the Medicare program. Next slide is capital. Um, you know, on this slide, uh, you know, what I'd like to point out is our FY18 to FY20 capital. Um, overall, that was low. Um, and why that was low is that was another indicator or that was another trigger point that uh, if we were having a poor performance year, um, we would look at our capital and we would pair it back. And so for 18, 19, and 20, um, we had low capital um, you know, um, overall. When you take a look at what was projected for 2021, as well as what was budgeted, as well as budget 2022, this is us taking that opportunity, reinvesting back into this organization, reinvesting in um, the equipment that this organization needs um, to actually offer the excellent care that uh, we've been able to offer. Moving to the overall detailed capital, these are our um, capital expenditures that are over 100,000. The biggest one um, is going to be um, an MRI project that will be ending um, the first quarter of 2022. That's actually um, a $2.7 million project. Um, the overall renovations are coming in at 1.2 and then the um, equipment itself is about 1.5. We have, uh, um, you know, a great deal, you know, on this list of uh, infrastructure projects, um, air handling units, um, negative pressure rooms, you know, fire uh, um, department connections, um, as well as major movable um, that we need to invest in. You know, we have a $500,000 x-ray project for an x-ray room that's very inefficient, um, an ultrasound machine of 150,000, and upgrading our cardiac um, monitors, which is about 142,000. Yep, great. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Appreciate your time. I know these are long discussions with a lot of data and hearing, so Jeff's going to try to bring this back. Great. Ask it. Um, and guys, are we stop? Did we stop sharing or? Uh, all we see is the C. If you could get back to where we could see you, it'd be good. There we go. There you go. Perfect. So we're going to start the uh, board questions with board member Pelham. Tom. Thank you. And uh, thank you folks from Copley. Um, you know, I'm impressed with the fact that you have painted a, uh, you know, a, a tough love picture, you know, and you could, but uh, you, I think sometimes you have to do that and understand it in order to pull yourself from where you are to where you want to be. And uh, so I appreciate the uh, the frankness in your presentation um, and recognition, um, and also the hope that if two or three years from now you're in a different place, um, uh, you will you will feel rewarded for that, um, and uh, and that's always a good feeling. So my uh, first question just is about bad debt and free care. Um, I'm looking at your 2019 through 2022 budget. And uh, bad debt um, has grown at a 34.9% annual rate 
from uh, 1.81 million to 4.44 million. And free care has grown at the rate of 23% a year from 841,000 to 1.56 million. Um, and I'm, uh, the year over year rates are respectively 54% for bad debt and 15% for um, free care. And I'm just wondering, and I know this is always a sensitive topic, but do you think there is potential there to better align these trends with the need for you to um, create more operating margin at the bottom line? Um, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you know, our bad debt, uh, some of the, uh, you know, um, reasons for the growth is we have seen that our revenue um, also has been increasing. Um, you know, I look at bad debt as, you know, a relationship of, you know, the expense to the overall gross charge. And, uh, you know, when I take a look at, you know, 2021, 2000, and, um, you know, uh, uh, the budget as well as the 22 budget, uh, um, you know, I see that uh, our free care, you know, overall the gross charges is, is very consistent year to year. Um, I do see that our bad debt uh, um, has, uh, you know, crept up uh, a little and, you know, um, and I feel that it is a relationship due to the pandemic and the inability for uh, people to, uh, um, you know, to be able to pay their bills. But overall, I mean, when it comes to bad debt, uh, you know, that is a federal program and we do follow, you know, the federal Medicare guidelines um, on that uh, um, on that program. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Just always looking into uh, every nook and cranny to uh, see Absolutely. what uh, small successes we might find. One very small one, uh, I would think maybe is a success, is just looking at the provider tax, is that hospitals in this last year have come in 5.8%, uh, 6% um, right on 6% for um, uh, as a percentage of their 2021 projection for NPR and FPP. And it's small money, but uh, everything counts that if you, you're in at 6.24% of your 2021 20, NPR FPP, and if you drop that down to 6%, which is the rate, the, the established rate, um, there's $194,000 that would, you know, float down to your bottom line, which is small potatoes, but relative to the size of your, mar your, size of your margin, um, it's, it's something, just yeah. an observation. So I'm I'm going to I'm looking here at the uh, the COVID-19 liabilities and on your um, balance sheet you're carrying for 2021 I think 16.9 million and in Appendix Seven uh, you project them as of September 30th 2021 at 19.8 million in liabilities including CARES Act funding at 5.8 million. Medicare advance repayments at 8.9 million and PPP funds at 5 million. And as of September 30th, 2022, the CARES Act and PP liabilities have been recognized as revenues. So uh, two questions. One, relative to those that have you moved out of the liability column to the revenue column, uh, do you have, uh, is that a firm uh, awareness on your part or is there some risk to that? Yeah, I'd wish I could uh, um, communicate that there's a firm, you know, um, you know, understanding of that. Uh, the thing that we have definitely discovered with both our PPP, um, you know, uh, loan as well as our, PR, our PRF funds is nothing is um, known. Everything constantly changes. And that's been the case, you know, overall with the uh, federal regulations on how to best handle this. I can communicate that, uh, um, you know, our PPP loan, um, we did, um, you know, submit that, uh, um, you know, that information to be um, converted from a loan into a grant. Um, that is still pending. We're still waiting for the SBA to get back to us with um, what that is going to uh, look like. In regards to our PRF, um, as you know, um, you've been hearing, um, you know, the period ended as of uh, um, July 1st. Um, we have been working closely with our auditors, um, making sure that uh, we're filling out the application for forgiveness appropriately. Um, and we're hoping to have that application, um, you know, submitted um, for review um, by HRSA um, in the middle of September. So there's some risk there. You just, it's still a bit, un bit unknown. Um, a bit unknown. 
and we're hearing that from other hospitals as well. Um, in terms of the repayment schedule for the Medicare Advanced repayment, what what, what is the rollout of that? How, how much are you um, are the are, how much are they kind of uh, hitting you for in terms of the repayment of that on a monthly basis, and and when do you think it will be fully repaid? I won't. Um... You know, I, in my brain, I, 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 I don't want to do the calculation, but overall, you know, when Medicare uh, released those, you know, they said that uh, when the repayment starts, um, you know, uh, which was uh, um, late spring, you know, they predicted it would take about a year um, to have that repaid. And that's where we kind of came in. And that's why you see on that uh, Appendix 7 that uh, um, liability being totally consumed in 2022. Okay. And those uh, loss of revenues are reflected in your payer mix, Medicare payer mix. Um, uh, loss of revenues. Uh, well, the recapture, you know, Med Medicare's recapture out of out of your. Okay. Uh, okay. That that's all reflected in your in your payer mix schedule. Absolutely. So basically, it uh, um, you know instead of uh, um, when the remittance advice came in for Medicare. You know, it used to be with cash, um, and now the remittance advices are coming in, and they're just saying, okay, now um, revert to your advance payments for that cash payment. So, yes, it is reflected. So, I, I'm curious. Um, I, I get the difficulties, and it's happening everywhere uh, with staffing. So, um, on one of the uh, um, budget documents you were showing, uh, an increase in FTEs uh, 2022 budget over uh, 2021 projected, I think was 35 or so FTEs. And I'm just wondering how you um, uh, how, how you in, how you internally consider, you know, uh, given your financial situation, uh, what what <coughs> positions to that are new to the organization these 35 FTEs and what positions are ones that become vacant and whether or not to fill them. So is there a, is there a net there? Um, I, I don't know whether there is, but is there a net there? Well, I'm just, I'm just going to jump in here, Tom, that um, we have actually had some pretty high expenses and lack of efficiency and even degradation of buildings and equipment because we don't have enough staff. And I think Don alluded to that because of burnout in other situations. So we have actually found that um, and um, we need clinical staff and we need support staff because we are just missing opportunity and we are causing problems. Uh, I'll tell you one of the things that we now look at in detail is every contract that is signed, not just a labor contract, but any contract of any service, piece of equipment um, goes through, it ends up going through the CFO in my office. And we have just found a lot of gaping problems and opportunity, which is great, but it's just because we haven't had controls in place. I think we're kind of on the edge of not having sufficient personnel to have controls, and it's actually costing us a lot of money, both with the providers, their efficiency, our charge capture, management. And so I know that's part of it. And I could give you a lot of examples where it's been surprising how much they have cut back over the years. Over the years um, um, call call and call it's been an expensive place to work <clears throat> because of that. Just a couple of more. Uh, I think in your payer mix for Medicaid, um, 22 budget over 21 budget, you're profiling a 21.7% increase um, in NPR FPP. And I'm just wondering that, you know, in, in, in the world of the cost shift, that seems like a big number to me. Yeah, Tom, if I could, um, that one I'd love to be able to, uh, um, I don't have that in front of me right now. Okay. Um, if I could get back okay. to you through an email, that would be great. Okay, that's fine. Um, and just a couple more here. Um, if Copley does decide, as I read from your narrative, that you're considering engaging in, in uh, One Cares Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont um, program, um, if, if, if you do decide to do that, 
what what's the scale of that? Um, you know, what what kind of uh, what kind of revenues would be moved into the FPP column? Uh, we did decide to do that, and I'm sure Jeff can find those. Um, so I think the uh, one care offer was if you don't participate in that, then you actually are removed from the Medicaid program. So that sort of changed the dynamics of our thought process. I'm sure you're familiar with that. So there was sort of a <clears throat> either either join that or jump out of all of it. So that was an interesting choice. Uh, did have to remind them, and I'll re remind folks everywhere that the critical access hospital designation is such that we're going to find it really difficult and would have to do a lot of review and soul searching to figure out if we would want to join the Medicare side and drop out of the current reimbursement methodology. So we did join the commercial, but Jeff, I don't know if you've got the numbers for him. Yeah, the numbers um, in regards to the commercial, and again, we'll work with our auditors. We're all um, you know, new to this um, you know, uh, modeling. But what was communicated uh, through OneCare is that the commercial product is still going to be paid through the typical remittance advice. It's not going to uh, look like a Medicaid uh, fixed payment. Um, you know, so um, right now uh, on the attribution, which was supplied, you know, for our Medicaid, it's going to go to that slide. Yeah, is our Medicaid uh, um, attribution right now is running about 5,100. And the attribution for the commercial product will jump uh, to 3,400. So we'll be increasing by 3,400. And one, one final quick question. Um, during our, our re review of the certificate of need for Silver Pines, uh, we were worried a bit that, um, you know, th they would be a competitor with you for staff. Uh, and so I'm just, uh, just curious now that they're up and running you know, have you seen any impact of 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 of, of silver pines and if, uh, on uh, in, in, to, to to you and uh, pro pro or con? Um, we learned about them uh, last year at this very same time when we did a hearing. Did not know who they were. Uh, that's called Sana. Oh. So Don, uh, Dr. Dupree knows who that is. So they've come to us and asked for some help <clears throat> and assistance in managing some of their quality program, maybe perhaps looking at issues of infection control and some staffing. So we've been working with them. They've been actually reimbursing us some of the expenses, not making any money off of that. But we've had some great discussions with them. Uh, Don and I took a tour um, so we're, we're, they're asking for help, so we're helping them. I think there is probably some staffing impact in this community, in this county, because they are hiring people. I think they're doing a slow startup, um, but I think a lot of us, it's, it's a for-profit, uh, separate organization. But the issue that uh, they deal with is near and dear to all of our hearts. So uh, whatever we can do to help people sort of transition away from behavior to more success is important. So we, we talk a lot about that, Don, probably. Yeah, Tom, to the best of my knowledge, we haven't had anyone leave here to, to go there, but we certainly <clears throat> compete with the same pool of, of nurses, although people might have a somewhat different uh, you know, approach to their profession working there than, than they would here, is they, is we, we don't really have an overlap of uh, medical concerns um, actually, my father-in-law just became their their internal medicine uh, chief. <laughs> there, he came out of retirement to do that. So, yeah, wow. and we, we wouldn't we wouldn't get him. So, <laughs> I think it, it you know it doesn't help us, but uh, it's certainly a plus for the community. It's mm -hmm. it's hard to feel bad about him. I think. Yeah, and mostly we we just feel you know we're glad they're doing what they're doing. Yeah. So your father-in-law went to work for Silver Pines. That's uh, such a small world. Um, thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, I'm through, Kevin. Thank you. I, thank I you just want, me. I just want to add one comment, Tom. Uh, going back to the PPP PRF money, um, the government 
last administration and even this administration has given away trillions of dollars, a word that I never knew existed. We all have learned the T word, trillions, but they never put the accounting construct around that. And it's been frustrating for all of us. And I wonder if there are any lessons learned that gets lessons learned that move their way up to our politicians and leadership to say, if we ever did this again, let's kind of put some parameters around this so that people all know what you should recognize and book and manage because it's been very unclear, which is a bit disheartening when you're talking trillions of dollars of what are going to be the rules, what is ours, what's going to be a loan, what's going to be a grant, what is some of each. So it's been kind of a national problem with trillions well, of dollars. But I, thanks for asking that. Well, I'm sure at the time in the beginning part of the crisis, it was get the money out the door and we'll clean up the mess later. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, so now it's time to clean up the mess. And I think that's where your uh, congressional right. uh, folks uh, come into play um, yeah. because they wanted to get the money out the door first, which was probably the right decision. Yeah. Um, but it's also people shouldn't be punished because they were sloppy getting the money out the door. Yeah, that's true. I, yeah, good point. Okay, thank you, Tom. Next, we're going to go to member Yusufur Maureen. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, actually, I'll, I'll start where you just left off on kind of the accounting for all of the COVID money and the, the PPP. Um, Jeff, I'm still having a hard time figuring out what's in your, uh, you know, at the bottom line, because it still seems that I'm sorry. There <clears throat> I'm sorry, is... Maureen. What's in your what for the bottom line? Uh, what's in the bottom line numbers because um, it still seems you're hanging some up on the balance sheet and not passing it through for 22. So if we talk about the CARES Act funding and the PPP and where that would sit on the income statement, um, knowing that you lost money in 2020 and, and many of the hospitals booked it in 2020, and then in 21, you're making a little bit of money and same in 22. But I, I just want to make sure we understand how much more is going to hit the income statement. Yeah, so, hit the income. yeah, potentially could hit the income statement. So one thing that I want to communicate is uh, um, in the state of Vermont, uh, um, Copley was I thought one of three hospitals. Um, I don't know if uh, Springfield actually did get the PPP monies, but I know that Grace and Copley actually got the um, PPP monies. You know, at first, uh, due to the uncertainty of how to book those monies, um, our auditors were like, okay, you're going to book like all the other Vermont hospitals, um, you know, a percentage of that, probably a, uh, um, you know, the majority of that in the 2020. Um, you know, financial close, but then at the last minute told us that we had to bring it back to the balance sheet, which we did. Um, you know, in regards to when we'll realize the uh, the bottom line effect, it's all going to be um, contingent on us understanding, you know, what the uh, final say is from the SBA and the final say from the uh, um, uh, HRSA. And so um, it is, you know, it's either going to be that um, we're able to book a good majority of it in 2021, um, you know, which, um, you know, we hope to be able to do, or we'll have to, uh, um, you know, have that roll into 2022. We're just working on our auditors to best understand how that needs to happen. But that's about... 5.5 um, over five million dollars right that's not reflected in these operating margins that could potentially flow through which it's not right. okay that's what i thought yeah and then on the cares act funding similarly the amount of money on the cares act funding that you um are that you could get relief for is that where is that showing in the income statement it's the same situation. At this point, our auditors have put us on hold until we have clarification. So it is not being represented. Right. And that's hugely significant when we look at, you know, all of the data you guys were talking about on where you stand for operating margin, what your what your historical trend has been. You know, if we put in $10 million more, that obviously changes that 
picture dramatically. Of course, it's from you know that that type of funding, but that was what some of that funding was supposed to do, right? <laughs> was to try to get us back on track for volume that we lost and things like that. So. I just want to make sure, you know, when we, because some of the other hospitals have already <laughs> rolled that in, uh, particularly the CARES of uh, PPP, most didn't get, but the CARES funding, they've, you know, moved off their balance sheet for the most part. They have very little left. No, okay. I, I, I'll just sort of jump in by saying, I've said this for years, it would, if we've got a system called the Vermont Hospitals, it would be really nice if we had a single auditor. <clears throat> then we're all following the same rules and advice. And then you're not having the problem, which we're having right now with the pandemic. We've had it in the past, we'll continue to have it. And that is you folks are trying to discern how people are interpreting big financial movements when in fact there's no consistency in the advice given to the hospital. So I'm a big proponent of a single auditor, not, not necessarily single payer, but single auditor. Just yeah. Yeah. No, no, and I know. And, but you know, I'm trying to get every, for myself to be able to yes. look at this on the same playing field because other people have rolled it through or haven't you made a lot of basis of your presentation on history and where you stand uh, on the operating margins and you know when this is all said and done in a year from now we may reflect back and say oh well actually your operating margins for whatever reason you know covid money um actually might, we'll be in a very different position than what we're looking at here. Yeah, I'm, I guess. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that's the case. I'm hopeful right. that all the efforts around every grant opportunity, all the federal issues that Jeff and his team went through, I mean, we spent a lot of time and effort to make sure that we could capture that opportunity. And hopefully, if that draws down money for us or the state, people are pleased with that. I know that that was one of our, our goals. And I guess the, the other side would be then looking at the cash flow statement and what your assumptions are for the money that's being paid back in or, or not captured. Um, if we're optimistic and you get to keep the PPP money, you get to keep the CARES Act money, um, how, if at all, will it change the cash flow position that you're showing in 22? It would, you know, um, I, you know, wouldn't be able to, I'd have to get back to you, you know, plug that through the modeling and stuff, um, you know, but when you take a look at days cash on hand, um, that is actually um, with the PRF monies as well as the PPP monies. And so you do get a, an understanding of what it means to that indicator. Well, it and is in the in 20 and 21, but we're, or, you know, then goes away so it seems like you're is, is yeah, that no, only the, the medicare advance money or are you assuming you're going to have to pay some of that back in 20 we had both the ppp on the balance sheet as well as the prf so that is actually showing it fully in there yes no i agree with that i agree with it yeah. so, so to talk numbers right in 20 you had 34 million dollars of cash on your balance sheet yep. and in 21 Right now, projection, you're saying 22.9. Um, and then in 22, you're saying 8.5. Um, but the COVID liabilities are, are wiped clean. And I'm just wondering, are you assuming in the 8.5 million cash balance in 22 that you've had to pay back any of the PPP or the CRF money? That would be the assumption at this point, yes, is okay. that we would have had to because we didn't know. We don't have a clarification on that yet. Yeah. So if we just hung it up on the balance sheet for mm -hmm. now, you'd have an additional at least $10 million more in cash, assuming for 22. Yes. Okay. Okay. No, that's what I thought. So. Yep. Um, I think we ran. I think we ran some numbers with that, Maureen, to see the impact and we go from being paltry to um, better, but still not in a great position. We're just, you know, we've got sort of days cash on hand problem that is pretty deep. So if that all works in our favor, I don't think we're gonna be certainly flush in any stretch of the imagination. Do you know what I mean? 
Uh, would be up pretty significantly. I mean, you know, some that there when you look at a five-year trend, five-year trend is not really as relevant to look at for cash flow. At the end of the day, how much cash are you going to have in 22? You're yeah. not going to average that on a five-year basis because that's that's a different animal. I think you'll be pretty pretty good relative to the numbers you were talking about. So, yeah. I, I can run the numbers too. It's you know, it's going to yeah. double. It's going to double your day's cash on hand, uh, potentially, or more than double where you thought you were going to be if you get to keep that $10 million. So it actually, you know, on the day's cash on hand, you know, indicator, we go from um, day's cash on hand around 84, and it brings it up to day's cash on hand with 98, and that is with the PPP and PRF included. So it's 14 days. Um. Okay, so I have to look at that calculation because you're going up quite a bit, but I know it puts in your other asset, board designated assets too, which you don't have many. So uh, in 21, in 20, you were at about 130, right? We can look at that. Okay. Um, and then just you know, on a comment on your some of your trends and your rating increase trend, where you, you know, we're showing charts of how low you are, you know, that's also a matter of time frame, right? If you look at a five years, you're you're low. If you look at a four year, including 20, your 22 request, you're the highest of all the hospitals for that four year trend including uh, Northwestern getting 13%, including others. So when you look at the four-year trend, um, you would be the highest hospital um, in rate request. And of course, there was a reason why the, some of the things were adjusted, you know, years back, you know, because of, of some, some of the issues with, um, you know, CON and things like that. There, there, was, there was a reason why there was adjustments, but you know, I just want to focus on, we can kind of slice and dice. And if you slice and dice on the five years, you're low. If you slice and dice on four year, you're the highest. Um, just talking about the reinstallation of the IT, the CPSI in 2021. Um, can you talk about any implications on, you know, revenue? You know, we, we've had some issues with some of the hospitals. Um, when you're putting in new EMR, re-implementing, do you expect any issues there with anything? So overall, you know, um, like other organizations, uh, the nice thing about doing a refresh is we're just basically going through setting up a new company. But for our employees, for our billers, for our registration staff, they're still using the same system. It will just be a more efficient system. However, you know, we are expecting that when this goes live, we will see our days in AR um, actually increase because of it. There will be inefficiencies because we'll have to make sure that those new tables are all working. So we are trying to go in with eyes wide open, understanding, you know, um, you know, the financial implications as to whether we feel like uh, um, we will see additional um, revenues. You know, we don't feel that uh, that's the case. It's more of a balance sheet exercise looking at our days in AR. Okay. And then just looking at your revenue growth and, you know, I, I know there's been some, some bumps, maybe I could say in, in prior years, but, um, 21 20 to 21 so the 69 to 79 million npr and then the 79 million to the 87 million um i think those are the two largest increases we're seeing you know in npr change year over year and just wanted to talk a little bit about you know particularly the npr change you know in in 2022 against the guidance of three and a half percent. Yeah. So, you know, overall, when we went into last year with our uh, um, our budget presentation, we communicated to um, our managers that, uh, um, you know, the future is definitely unknown. 
with how we need to budget for uh, COVID and what it means to the organization. So there was roughly, um, you know, um, a calculation of a little bit over 5% reduction in volumes due to uh, um, due to the unknown COVID experience. Um, in addition, um, in 2021, we did have the ability to um, acquire um, or hire um, the neurologist and podiatrist, which is also influencing the 2022 budgets with additional net revenues that uh, were not in 2021 or not in um, the 2021 budget. Um, and then the rest, the remaining increase is the uh, um, actual rate increase. Okay, thanks. And then just on some of the price comparisons where, um, and I think that's good to be able to show, you know, where, where you stand and, and you guys are are lower in a lot of the things that you're looking at. Uh, um, what, what are the areas though where you get most of your revenue and where does you stand there? So like orthopedics, uh, the cancer treatment, things like that aren't really included here. So I, I just wonder what percentage of the things you're showing the pricing on, what percentage of your NPR do they represent? I don't, I don't think we know that. That's a good question, Maureen. I, we, we just did the lab one because it was requested of us this past year, we figured we'd share that with you. And we just did, you know, what's the old fashioned inpatient room rates, the emergency room diagnostic imaging. But I think uh, more discussion about how do we look at rates, I think is warranted. I'd be happy to do that. I think that's, uh, you know, it does get uh, convoluted when you sort of ultimately figure out what you get paid. But with patients and people who are shopping around with an HSA that they're trying to use to potentially supplement their retirement income, price matters and they want to know that. And so in Vermont, in the small state of Vermont, we've got some significant variation and uh, we're on the low end of that, which is a little bit problematic. Um, you know? I'd love to advocate just, uh, you know, Vermont average prices for everybody. So you don't have to necessarily shop around. You pursue what you think to be quality, not necessarily a price savings. No, so I don't I have an answer. Yeah, I mean, I don't have the answer to that, but we could do more studies to look at that. I think we're pretty cost effective because people come to us of a large part of orthopedics and surgery related for, for both price and because of uh, quality of care. We, we get both, actually. <clears throat> yeah. and, um, yeah. and I think it is helpful for us to be able to look at that and compare. So yeah. um, I'm all set. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Maureen. You. Next, we'll turn to Jessica. Jessica Holmes. Great. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Really helpful. Um, Jeff, I think this is probably a question for you. I'm trying to understand, uh, you mentioned in the presentation, and I think in, uh, in answer to the staff questions that your projections from 2021 haven't changed. Um, and I'm trying to, so I was looking at um, year to date results through June. And again, I'm getting this data off of our Tableau Interactive. So hopefully what I'm downloading is correct. So correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but from when I see from what I can see, your NPR as of June um, is already about $5 million over budget, 62.5 versus 57.5 in the budget. Is that right? Yeah, I believe it is, yep. Okay. Um, and so your submitted projections have you coming in about $4 million over budget. You still have three months to go. And from what we hear about hospitals at capacity, volume stronger than ever. In June alone, from what I can tell, your NPR was about a million dollars over budget, if that's also right. So as I'm thinking about this, you're five million dollars over budget already. If July, August, and September look like your June, that sounds to me like you could be upwards of, of eight million dollars over budget for NPR when you're projecting only to be about four million dollars over NPR. So am I, am I yeah. thinking about this correctly or is there another way to it? I guess I'm just trying to figure out from what I'm seeing. And again, I could not have, I could have these numbers off, but it sounds to me like your projections of 80 million for 2021 might be off yeah. given the volumes that we are seeing now and, and where you're already at. So overall for Copley, you know, when we take a look at our revenue um, and 
we have to understand that COVID has been, you know, um, is exacerbating this issue. We have a lot of staff, um, you know, that need to take time off uh, more so than ever. Um, we are experiencing that um, as well. And our, uh, you know, basically what we're seeing is our surgery revenue. There was a lot of, uh, um, you know, COVID need that was getting pushed through the system. We are seeing that that is um, backing off. People are taking the appropriate time off and that is what's causing the major variance that you're looking at. Okay. And so your current operating gain through Q3 was 1.4 million. Your, uh, in the presentation, you projected 500K yeah. for the whole year. So is there something that's going to reduce that operating gain from 1.4 back down to 500? Yeah, and again, you know, uh, um, right now as we closed uh, um, our financials, we're running about 1 million to 1.5. We're predicting for the last two months, which uh, um, typically always run at operating losses, that that will get us close. You know, are we going to be at the uh, 500,000? We'll be close to that due to the operating losses that we've always seen year in and year out, and that's what's built into that prediction. Okay. Okay, because I'm just, it was surprising to me because most other hospitals are seeing so much surge and so much volume returning in their EDs and elsewhere that they're now revising upward their projections for 2021. So it was surprising to see Copley not doing that. Um, also, another surprise was actually the only 57K in investment returns, particularly given the market performance this year. That was just seemed surprising to me and a little bit lower than what we've seen elsewhere. Is there... Was that a surprise to you? I mean, that's. There's not many uh, investments if you take a look at our balance sheet for Copley. So we don't have uh, um, great yeah. endowments and stuff. So that's the reason for the low return. Okay. That's what I, I mean. That's what I figured. But it was just, you know, surprising for, for some reason to me. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Copley, might be a question for you. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, Mathematica, which is a, you know, a, a consultant that we have, provided us with some hospital by hospital analyses of potentially avoidable utilizations. And the analyses that they did, it's, it's only for um, Medicare fee for service, but about a third of the in ED Medicare fee for service. I'm sorry, Jessica, you're cutting out. About a third of, did you say a third? Yeah, a third, 33% of Copley's inpatient and ED Medicare fee-for-service revenue is potentially avoidable if patients had access to timely care in a more appropriate setting and all of that. Uh, your rate, Copley's rate, is actually higher than the state median on that measure, as is the proportion of Medicare fee-for-service coming from 30-day readmissions. Now, I know that Copley doesn't own <clears throat> care practices, but I'm wondering, um, as we're thinking more about moving towards value-based payment and your participation in a lot of these, you know, One Cares programs, how do you uh, think about partnering with the primary care practices and other community partners to bring down some of that uh, potentially avoidable utilization at the hospital? It's particularly, it sounds like your community collaborations have expanded, you know, through COVID. So, <laughs> you know, hope that some of these measures might come down. Yeah, um, I couldn't agree more with pretty much everything you said. Um, one issue with the Mathematica study, which I did get to look at, was that it, it was kind of hard to tell just where the data came from. So it was kind of hard to know. And it's claims data. And in, with claims data, the devil's always in the details. So but we'll just assume that the story it tells is, is, is roughly right. The, the one thing that on the readmission data that it had in the Mathematica study, it doesn't seem to jive with the with the VAS data. You know, that, 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 I don't know if you can see that, but but it, the, the the readmission data is really different. So we're not quite sure, but yeah. So we're a hospital without without primary care. So when people show up, we're we're obligated, and it's our it's our duty, and it's what we do to, to take care of them. So. Um, what we can really do to address this problem is, is what we tr are in fact trying to do, which is make sure that when people leave the ED or leave the hospital, that they do have a primary care physician and they, they do have an appointment. And if they need home health, they have that. If they need elder care, Meals on Wheels, if they need those services, uh, that's how we, we close the loop. Um, you know, the issues of how soon people get in and how happy people are to go to their primary care providers. All we can really do is, is, is root for them. And uh, we work really hard with our, with our local primary 
care offices to, to be supportive and to any way that we can help, we obviously want to do that. We have traditionally worked with the manor on, uh, on readmissions from the manor to try to figure out how we can reduce that. We have uh, a social worker that we used to share with the FQHC across the street to do exactly that, to get conduits, particularly high volume users, to get them into the primary care. Uh, and we have two case managers and the social worker uh, on the floor that essentially uh, do the same thing. Um, but until we actually, or unless we actually had our own primary care, the number of levers we can pull on that are, are somewhat limited. And, and I feel like we're definitely pulling them, but we are not unaware uh, of this you know, of this issue that the COPD, the CHF, diabetes issues, which we agree could definitely be not yeah. driven to zero, but could be improved. Yeah. Is it something that you track internally? I know we heard from Northeastern um, that they are starting to track the potentially avoidable utilization, particularly in their ED. And so maybe Mathematica's isn't doing it, you know, the way that you would like to do it. Is it something that you're actually tracking internally? We sure were before COVID. <laughs> okay. And uh, there's no question that that and almost any other thing like that you could think of just got brutalized the last year. But yeah, it was something we were quite mindful on and, and we had a dedicated person who worked just at that. So okay. yeah, it's definitely, we see that as our job. We think it's important and um, you know, we'll give more energy to it as the energy gets sucked away less. <laughs> Understood. And actually, I think, you know, I'm probably going to, uh, after the debrief of all these hospitals, uh, budget presentations, one of the things I'm going to suggest, actually, is that's part of the submission so we can understand how hospitals are working their way at bringing down some of that. So if, if you're already tracking it or plan to restart tracking it again, that's great, because I, I would like to see all hospitals do that and for us to learn how that number can be, you know, diminished. Um, Wait times. I'm just, you know, wanted to bring that up. What is your target for third next available appointment? Actually, something I've meant to ask all the hospitals, but what would be an ideal target for days for third next available appointment? I don't think that at this time we have the right yeah, I mean, target for any specific specialty or for all. Well, in general, you know, I'm just sort of wondering. Like we can, we've yeah. now that hospitals have submitted them. I'm wondering where do hospitals, you know, shoot for? And, you know, some of them are looking high on yours. You know, oncology, neurology, ortho, cardiology. They're all over two months. That seems high to me, but maybe that isn't high. So I'm trying to figure out what is, where do you say this is high, and we need to work on, you know, increasing access or reducing days to third next available appointment. Sure. Yeah, so uh, the e easy answer is uh, it's very hard to know what the number should be, uh, as it's particularly in our case, because we're a resource limited facility where we have limited resources uh, to adjust it. I can tell you with, with cardiology, uh, at least once a year, uh, Dr. Kunin sits down with everyone and we look at exactly how the referral patterns are going about what the return intervals are, because we would like it to be less than 65 days. What, you know, what the right answer is, that's hard to say. And you know, in, in one sense, we'll do the best we can, but you know, if, if the right answer is 12, it's probably not realistic for one general practitioner cardiologist in the system. For, for general surgery, uh, it's eight. My, my feeling is that's probably too long. Uh, most people that need us need us pretty soon, and um, and I, I think you know what I talked about before was that we have cut our <laughs> office staff way past cutting away the fat, and it's 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 made us definitely slower and, and responsive. So I know we can improve on that. Uh, orthopedics was exactly the same issue. At one point, we cut so much that it was. Just hard to answer the phones, and um, and we're definitely working on that. Oncology is basically whatever I said about cardiology. You could just apply to oncology. Uh, Dr. Ospina comes over from uh, CDH, you know, pretty frequently, but it's you know really 
almost never more than four times a month. And the demand is, is definitely higher. So I think we definitely, we understand where you're coming from. We feel the same way and uh, we'll get it as low as we can, but it's going to be hard to get it where anyone would really like it. There's so many indicators that we're always looking at hundreds of indicators. Uh, I don't think any of us look at it and say, well, we're going to spend a whole bunch of money and time on pulmonology or orthopedics. It's, we're just too small. It doesn't work that way. And plus, you can't even get locums as much. I mean, travelers are even hard to find. <clears throat> so for us, it's not an easy thing to say, why don't we you know, really address the top three or four areas that have the, the, the longest third next available appointment. We'd go would go bankrupt. Our expenses would go through the roof and you'd be asking me next year, what did you do? <clears throat> and I said, well, I addressed the three, four highest areas, spent a ton of money, um, but it's still in a small organization. It still doesn't work that way. <clears throat> to find another cardiologist. It takes relationships. It takes time. It's not, it's not like I can just hire a cardiologist. I mean, I'm saying that as a small hospital. I think the same is true for some of the larger hospitals. It's just hard to get these people to move with their families, to want to be in Vermont. So I wish we could turn it up and down a little bit better. We, we can't really though, just to be honest with you. I wish we could. It just, it's really hard to. Yeah, we're, we're painfully aware that there are people on the other side of the phone who right. want to see us that we're not accommodating as promptly as they'd like. Yeah. Uh, and I guess my final question it builds a little bit on some of Maureen's questions around the pricing and for us to try and actually and to Joe, your point about trying to understand, you know, pricing comparisons across hospitals and all of that. Yep. Um, when you submitted your budget, you responded to the HCA's questions about the reimbursement ratios relative to Medicare by saying that Copley doesn't track the info that way, but you'd be willing to work with the HCA to provide suitable information. So I'm wondering, um, how, you know, what did you work out with the HCA in terms of a, an alternative way to provide that kind of baseline comparison across all services, not not just the ones that you, you know, provided in the presentation, which were extremely helpful, but a baseline alternative way to measure Copley's um, reimbursement rates relative to other, in, you know, relative to Medicare or something else. So we actually, uh, um, last week that we finally uh, talked with the HCA, had a great conversation about reimbursement, you know, all the different models. <laughs> One of my first uh, recommendations um, with them is to try to understand the uh, um, differences in the reimbursement models throughout all of the organizations. Come up with a grid, understand what, you know, an APC means in regards to Medicare reimbursement versus a critical access you know, reimbursement. I think it's really important. You know, it kind of goes to one of the slides that we presented. You know, you have your tweeners, you have your medical center, and then you have your critical access hospitals. But even within the critical access hospitals, you have an issue. And that issue is what you were saying. We are an organization that doesn't have primary care. We have an organization that, you know, for the most part is, you know, specialists. So even within critical access, you have all these different methodologies that you need to really first and foremost, and try, you know, um, to understand what that means to the organization. Because for Medicare, it changes our cost. It changes our cost of charge ratio and it changes our reimbursement. But if you were to take us and compare us maybe to a North country that does have primary care, you might like uh, uh, not actually uh, um, be able to utilize that in the most appropriate way and stuff. So that was, you know, step one. And I, I, I love having conversations about trying to figure this out, you know, and uh, encourage them to uh, um, keep talking with us. But that was my first thing is really start to get the grids, start to understand just with Medicare. And I think it's going to be an incredibly complicated grid to put together, but so that we all, you know, know what we're looking at. So that was my recommendation to start with the process. Okay, great. Thank you very much. That's all I have, Kevin. Thank you, Jess. Um, next, we have board member Lund, Robin. Thank you. Good to see you all. All of my questions have been answered, asked and answered, so I'm good. Great. Thank you, Robin. Um, Don, I must admit that I'm tempted to interrogate you about why your father-in-law won't come to work for you, but in, since it's close to lunchtime, I'm going to pass on that question. And, and Joe, in the historical look at the data that you prepared, um, mm -hmm. did you include mid-year um, 
adjustments as well as just uh, at the uh, hearings? Uh, I'd have to ask Jeff, mid-year adjustments in the approved rates. Uh, we didn't have any mid-year adjustments in our approved rates. Okay, so um, for example, Springfield a couple years ago got a 5% yeah. uh, mid-year up. Uh, I'm going back in time like five or six years ago, Rutland yeah. came in and asked for a 5% down. Yeah, so Kevin, in regards to all this data um, was acquired off of the Green Mountain Care Board website. So um, yes, those would be um, in there, um, you know, as long as they were in the um, data that I'm was- I'm not sure they are, because when I look at my own staff's uh, calculations, I, I don't think oh. mid-year adjustments are in there. That's why I was asking. I, okay. I was hoping yours was more complete, but it doesn't appear to be. <laughs> yeah, so we were relying on your data. <laughs> So I hate to ask this question, given that Joe is talking about trillions of dollars, but Jeff, I'm struggling on um, the the change of charge. You're saying that one percent equals seven hundred and thirty four thousand two seventy nine, and then you're saying that equates to three point eight million in additional revenues. When I do the multiplication, it comes out to three point six seven million. What am I missing? Hey, I'm probably nothing. Let me, if I could, Kevin. Let me go back and uh, verify that calculation. Okay, great. So with that, um, engineer like you can get it to me at a later time as long as I okay. get it. With that, I'm going to move to the healthcare advocate and uh, turn it over to them for questioning. Thanks so much, Chairman. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'm just going to ask one question. I want to start off by thanking uh, the hospital for all your work during the pandemic, of course, um, particularly during the surge now. So thank you. Um, I want to communicate our, our gratitude. Um, our question is, and we asked this of Mount Escutney as well, there was a high-profile piece in the Sunday edition of the New York Times over the weekend about the tremendous variation in hospital insurer prices for the same product or service around the country. If so, do you have any comment about that article? If you had a chance to read it, and if not, do you think it, or if, if you have, do you think it applies to Vermont? Um, and if not, uh, do you have any explanation for the rare variation in those different services? Thanks. Uh, I didn't read the article. I think um, we have rediscovered this problem in America dozens of times in states and across the country in terms of the variation of cost and prices and all that. I don't. Um, I, I don't know the variation in Vermont, but I don't know if you've seen that article. Have you seen that article? Yeah, I read the article, and I was probably just as appalled as every other American that you could have a four or five times difference. Uh, but, I mean, I, I don't know how much our prices vary from insurer to insurer on the individual contracts. That's That's not really what I do here. <laughs> so, Sam, again, uh, you know, I think it comes down to, you know, um, we all have to understand our data. We all have to understand all the different uh, payment methodologies that are out there. And I think that that um, without that understanding, that's why we're seeing these, you know, incredible swings, you know, um, from one payer to another payer. And, uh, um, you know, and it's just coming out. Uh, you know, I think I feel that uh, you know, there was a lot um, riding on uh, the price transparency rules that uh, you know Medicare released. Um, unfortunately, you know, um, for people that uh, you know work in the uh, um, in that kind of the reimbursement area, it was like, holy Moses, this is just going to be very confusing to the consumers because there is this incredible variation between these um, internal contracts that uh, individuals have. There is, um, you know, um, just with uh, um, the price to charge ratio for a critical access hospital versus what a uh, tertiary care center gets through APCs. Variation's pretty incredible. But Sam, even though it's probably not apples to apples, but uh, but our price for an MRI of a, of a joint is 1600, which would have put us way on the low side mm -hmm. of the prices in that study. Got it. Thanks. Appreciate it. Back to you, Chairman. Thank you so much, Sam. At this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment on the Copley uh, budget presentation. Does any member of the public wish to offer public comment? It's Dale. Yeah. Dale. I do see a hand up. So, Dale. Yes. Could you clarify me for me a little more? I just 
quickly went and read an article from Moody because I read on this four or five months ago. Days cash on hand is they classified it as well. If you're going to do capital investments, etc., you want 63 days cash on hand. You want six months days cash on hand. Um, what do you consider a reasonable number for days cash on hand? Considering all the factors, like Copley mentioned, they, they've got staff that needs vacation. They haven't had vacation. This comes out of days cash on hand. It just hasn't been accounted that way yet. So any kind of clarification in there you can give so that those listening in can understand this number better? So uh, I'll just make a couple comments, Dale. I think... Um, Going back to Sam's question about data, <clears throat> oftentimes we don't look at data critically and we don't question the highs and lows. You have to look at data over time and the, the range. Sometimes we need to throw out high data points because they might not be accurate or low data points. For us, we're hopeful to move towards the average. That's what we're looking at. We got two average points, Vermont Critical Access Hospital data average and then Northeast CH average. Um, we're significantly below average, so it's a concern for us. And uh, I would at least to at least be in the range of average or certainly less expensive. But uh, moving towards the middle uh, is not a bad thing. I think that is sometimes helpful. So I don't know if Jeff wants to add more about what our goal is. Yeah, the one thing that I will say, Dale, is uh, the Moody's data and the Fitch data um, for small critical access hospitals, um, there's quite a, a, a difference. Um, you know, we're talking about the, um, the Moody's data is for very large hospital organizations. Um, for us as critical access hospitals, I do like what has been presented by the Green Mountain Care Board, and that's, you know, looking at, uh, um, you know, your northeast critical access average, or just looking at the, uh, as Joe was saying, the Vermont average as kind of our guide to uh, what we need to uh, best uh, um, strive for. Okay, thanks. That actually helps me to understand this issue a little better, too, as I look at the broader picture. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Is there other public comment? Seeing and hearing none, I wish to thank you, gentlemen, for uh, a thorough budget presentation. Um, there were a couple things you were going to get back to us on. We appreciate that. And uh, um, with that, do I have a motion from a board member to adjourn this hearing? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn the meeting. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you and have a great rest of the day. <laughs>